Well, when you hear that snappy music, you know that you are watching Speechless. Mr. Tim Kinley is on vacation this evening, but he's asked me, Diana Longry, to stand in and present the show this evening. Now, I hope that you will enjoy the information that I have to share with you. This is a live broadcast coming to you from the SCC studios, and we are also live in St. Paul. With it being a live program, we encourage you to call in with any questions or comments you may have on this evening's topic. Because after all, public access TV is the citizens TV. Now this evening, the topic that I'm going to be covering includes a lot of film footage from a recent Maplewood Human Rights Commission meeting. Now every community in our viewing area, if not throughout the state, has to define what it means for public safety and the mission of public safety in their community. And of course, that goes right to what is the mission of the police department in providing public safety in their community. Now, depending upon the size of your community, that mission may be different than if you are Ely, Minnesota, versus being St. Paul, Minnesota. There's going to be certainly that public safety aspect of responding to calls to being first responders. But then, does that mission broaden? Does that mission go beyond the typical, traditional policing activities of the police department? Well, that is a question that Maplewood is soon to have a discussion about because the new police chief, Mr. Uh, chief Schnell, has some ideas about what he would like to do to have community building being more a part of the mission of Maplewood's police department. Now, as I mentioned, this film footage is from the July 8, 2014 uh, Civil Service Commission meeting. And Chief Schnell starts off by talking about the recent discontinuation of the D.A.R.E. program being sponsored by the Maplewood Police Department in the schools of Maplewood. So let's get started with that first clip. You may know um, in the uh, fall of last year, we made um, a decision, um, a, a difficult one at that, to, to, to take a look at D.A.R.E. Uh, the city had been doing D.A.R.E. for some years um, and um, wildly popular in many of the schools that we did it. Many young people, uh, trust me, I got letters from young people who said, who were planning, hoping to go to D.A.R.E. and now all of a sudden you're not going to do it. And making that decision um, was really about looking at efficacy. Is, is this really, one, is it working? Two, who is it serving? Um, how effectively is it serving? Is, um, to use my language, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the level of investment that we're putting into this really yielding the kinds of outcomes that we would hope? And the truth of the matter is there was a lot of really positive things that came out of DARE. The connections between officers and those sorts of things, which we value and think are important. At the same time, um, there was a couple of things that, that a lot of people did not know about. Some schools in, um, in Maplewood participated in D.A.R.E., others did not. Um, the reason that some schools did not was simply because those schools were under significant pressure uh, to achieve higher test scores, which as parents, we want our kids to, and we want our schools to perform well, and so that's understandable. The school's goal then is to increase seat time, the amount of time a student has for uh, learning content, and um, being able to use that ultimately to improve test scores and uh, those sorts of things. And D.A.R.E. really is a, it's a nice to do, it's a good thing to do, um, but it doesn't, it's, it's not one of the tested components. As you heard him describe there, not all schools in Maplewood participated in D.A.R.E. And when I was mayor of Maplewood, we would always have a, a D.A.R.E. graduation at the schools that participated. 
and a contest where students would write an essay as to what it was that they learned in D.A.R.E. And much of the focus of D.A.R.E. had to do with what uh, types of drugs are out there in the market, what things to look out for, uh, what these uh, chemicals can do to your body, the, the bad consequences that you could face. Also, talking and addressing how to deal with peer pressure and how to deal with some of the other struggles that oftentimes young students in our schools are faced with. And as you heard him say, uh, it wasn't necessarily part of the core curriculum of which then the students are tested on for those test scores. And I found though that many of the students did appreciate having this program available to them that were participating because they came away with tools that they could learn uh, that they could learn uh, from the DARE program that they then could use later on in life. So the struggle then becomes, is there a way to communicate this type of information to students uh, and still be able to have them uh, have time to study the appropriate classroom subjects that they need, the study, for the testing scores? Well, I'm not certain that there was ever any discussion about how to incorporate DARE into maybe those reading uh, uh, elements that are needed as part of the testing, uh, how to incorporate the ability to uh, write essays and to compose sentence structures and, and paragraphs, or even in using uh, mathematics and calculating uh, certain instances of things that could be incorporated into the D.A.R.E. program. Instead, it was just the way that it's being run right now, it isn't a match for the schools, so we're going to cut it out. And the chief has something in mind and how he would like to replace that program with a much larger program, which as we get into, I want you to start to think about, okay, now if we weren't able to incorporate the basic principles of D.A.R.E. into the classroom, of giving students tools to be able to deal with bullying, to give them uh, tools to deal with peer pressure, to understand the, the problems of using drugs and alcohol, if we weren't able to use D.A.R.E. as that program, as a supplementary program, how are we going to be able to use a much larger program to accomplish a much broader social uh, need. Let's listen in. And when we looked at where the schools that really were not doing DARE, quite frankly, it is schools where perhaps some of our challenge, some of the challenges would be greatest. Probably our highest levels of diversity, Certainly areas where we have uh, much higher levels of economic disparity. Um, and it's ironic that we are investing resources, and, I, and I, trust me, investing resources if we're getting that yield is absolutely worthwhile. But we're investing resources, in many cases, in kids that are going to do well no matter what. And, um, and not, not all of them, but many of them are. And uh, does that mean that we shouldn't do it? Uh, I'm not saying that, but ultimately we have to look at equity and fairness and those sorts of things. Second, when we looked at the data about outcomes, while um, young people were clearly, and the data showed uh, compellingly, that there was positive things that emerged from the relationship that the long-term yield in terms of um, avoiding drugs and alcohol, illicit use of drugs and alcohol, simply the, the data didn't bear that out that the program was being effective. Um, that he said that and that we were investing money into those who were going to succeed anyway basically was a polite way to say that the majority of the schools that continued with the D.A.R.E. program were the private schools. Those schools such as St. Jerome, Gethsemane, uh, um, and then uh, the one that's on Prosperity, which, uh, 
cross it <laughs> slips my mind but it, there but basically the private schools uh, and and it was the other schools that perhaps had dropped the dare program so now his question is well founded how are we going to reach those at risk kids to give them the tools they need well then now it gets down to how do we identify those children now, I understand we have a caller on the line, so let's get our caller on, and then we will return to our film footage. Go ahead, caller. Mayor Longry, thanks for this excellent show. The, in those clips that you just showed, I was kind of confused. First, you were saying that a lot of people did not know about the, uh, the chief, Paul Schnell was saying that a lot of people did not know about uh, certain things about the program. And I'm thinking, which organization, which people were most responsible for telling people about what was going on with the DARE program? <laughs> that would be the former chief, Dave Tamala. So actually, there he's laying the blame on that Dave Tamala did not communicate with people, with the general public, with the taxpayers of what was going on. You know, that's a tragedy because we hope that the police chief tells us what's going right and what's going wrong. And then Paul Schnell goes on, Chief Paul Schnell goes on to say we are investing resources in kids who are going to do good regardless of what. Now, I might be mistaken, but I thought the D.A.R.E. program had just one mission. The mission was to say no to drugs. It sounds like that he was saying he never even talked about the issue of drugs or alcohol. He was talking about doing good, which seems to be a greater, a bigger, huge subset, not just about what everybody in the community believes that D.A.R.E. was to do, to uh, set kids knowledgeable and set them against the bad effects of drugs. Isn't it confusing? I mean, what was the role of D.A.R.E.? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And before I forget, I want to give a shout out to uh, Presentation School because that is one of the other schools that was uh, uh, a very strong supporter of the D.A.R.E. program. But the caller's right on in that the program of D.A.R.E., who was running it, who was promoting it? The city of Maplewood, the police department. So if people we're not aware of the benefits of DARE or aware of what its purpose was or its availability. Uh, it all does go to the heart of what was and how was it being promoted by the police department. Now, Maplewood uh, did help fund the DARE program. The council annually would vote to approve a certain amount for that budget, but it wasn't a lot of money. And I think if I recall correctly, I think it was only about $10,000 a year. And keep in mind, Maplewood has a $38 million budget, operating budget a year. So we're not talking big change here. And, and, and the caller is also correct in that there was a, an informative program. It was an, a program to give the children tools to deal with saying no to drugs, saying no to peer pressure, and also how to deal with bullies. This new program, it goes way beyond that scope. It goes beyond that so far that it doesn't actually even only include the children anymore, but it also goes to actually directing adults as to what they should do. And my question to the viewers is, is this the role of our public safety officers as we get into what is going to unfold? So let's go on to our next clip. So we, we in, this, in the fall, we, we brought um, in a man, uh, Derek Peterson is his name. He's a, he lives in St. Paul now. He's a Minnesota native um, and then grew up, uh, born here, raised in, I think, South Dakota. Uh, now lives uh, here but travels, spends most of his time on the road. And he um, took a lot of the work that really came out of Minnesota. You um, are probably familiar with Search Institute that did a whole lot of that work around community asset build and community asset building. And... Um, saw the real significant benefits of that. But 
Here's one of the things that Derek noticed around some of the stuff that Search found. Search found that if the more assets that we give uh, young people, um, the better their outcomes are. It, it makes good intuitive sense. Now, what he is saying, of course, makes sense. Of course it makes sense. But it goes to the question, is this part of the role of the police department the public safety sector of our municipal government to be doing social services. Are there other community assets that are in a better position to do what it is that he is asking the city of Maplewood to be involved in? Now, you heard how he said he had Derek Peterson come to the city and that they were talking about this. And he makes it sound like this is a bright and new, shiny idea that he has gotten. Now keep in mind that Chief Schnell is new to Maplewood, but he came from Hastings. In all of the presentations that he has given to the council, and that he has given to the commissions on this idea of his, he has not shared with them in any of the presentations I have heard that this program he actually promoted in the city of Hastings. So let's bring up our screen generator here so I can take a moment to show you that this is from the council packet of the city of Hastings. And it is uh, to the mayor and city council. It is dated January 14th, 2013 from Paul Schnell, the police chief, where they're asking the city council to approve financial support in the amount of $10,000 towards a joint United Way ISD, that's the school district, 200 and a City of Hastings Youth Prevention Initiative called Helping Kids Succeed the Hastings Way. Well, you see, this program is actually then coming from this guy, this consultant, Derek Peterson, who originally got this big grant up in Alaska to do the same thing, and where he has a program up there called Ala Helping Kids the Alaskan Way. So you see, it's making its way to Maplewood to be the Maplewood way. And so you can see by looking at this memorandum, and I know that for our viewers there at home, it's rather small. But what you can see is that uh, they are going to be, pu they put together this program in Hastings, and they, they got $10,000 from the City Council of Hastings. They also have the county submitting uh, money uh, through their uh, filing fee charge. There's a little fee. And also United Way is chipping in money. And they're all going to be working on this evidence-based best practices program that has achieved impressive results in communities in the United States and abroad. Now, this sounds like the work of a nonprofit. And is this the work that should be engaged in by a municipality? A city is engaged in doing the essential services for uh, the citizens. Now, if we are, we are done here with our, our um, memo, and so let's go on to our next clip and, and continue. The problem is, is that you, you, we, communities then went out and started to say, how is it that we build and grow these developmental assets in our communities so that young people are brought up? And, and that's a great question. And many communities went out and invested heavily youth programs, uh, drop-in centers, um, just a whole range of different types of activities and, and, and programming, and, um, and found that um, at the end of the day, uh, it didn't bring all kids up. And, and one of the things that Derek noted, and he, trust me, he's a, he's a huge supporter and fan of, of Search and Search's research, and uses a lot of it, 
But one of the things that he, that he believed, uh, based on his research and based on some of the other things that he did, what was, what was missing was the part that made kids stick to these assets, stick to these, these, the infrastructure, the programs that ultimately made them more successful. So in essence, what he's saying is that there's been a lot of programs that have come before this that have been a one shot in the arm type of program where kids have been involved. They're given these tools, they're giving support, but then once they leave the program, that's pretty much the end of it. And because there's no follow up or that there isn't any other extra, uh, what he wants to call assets being injected somehow, it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's so it doesn't stay with the kids long term. And so what he's really trying to get across is that we've got a lot of things that work in the short term, which I think he would also imply that DARE follows, falls in that category. But in the long term, what are we doing to make these programs and these tools and these assets we give the kids stay with them in the long term? Well, I don't disagree with that question because that is a very valid question because oftentimes you can do short-term things and if you don't have something in play to keep those short-term gains in the long term, then it's for naught. And so I don't disagree with that philosophy, except that my question is, and the questions for the citizens and the viewers, is this the role of our local police department? Because in essence, this program is being initiated, promoted, and as you will hear later, a campaign of the police department. The reason that this bothers me is because I believe that the police department should be focusing on the day-to-day -day business of patrolling our neighborhoods, of responding to calls for service, of doing the things that our police department needs to do within the community. And I think it's important that they are a positive community presence, but they are not social workers. And the reason that I bring this up is because I was in a recent hearing where the police chief Schnell testified as to Maplewood's patrolling policy. Most citizens think that the police, that they have patrolling routes that they are on throughout their community. And I hear this time and time again, especially from the people in the south end of Maplewood, that they never see a police car in the south end. That's because they have this impression and the feeling that Police in Maplewood actually have patrol routes that they routinely kind of go along in their day-to-day -day activities. But in this hearing, Chief Schnell indicated that that's not really the policy that they have in Maplewood, that they really only concentrate their efforts on those areas that are problem areas or where they have a higher incidence of calls. And so if you happen to be in a quiet area of Maplewood, for instance, you will not see cars patrolling there because that's not part of the policy. And so what I'm troubled about is that if they don't have the time and the resources to do routine patrolling of quiet and safe neighborhoods, how are they gonna have the time and the money and the resources to become social workers for the community. Let's take a look at the next clip. Successful. And so when he looked at and assessed the issue of stickiness, stickiness comes in the form of people. And, and I think, I think about this in my own life, I think all of us can think about this. This is what makes a difference. And 
from that then, uh, Derek began to take a look at using the kind of developmental assets that came out of Search Institute, and then began to look at other types of data, um, and ultimately secured a very large grant in Alaska. Um, and went to Alaska and um, did uh, and uh, implemented what he ends up calling integrative youth development and taking a whole variety of these of this heavily research based stuff and implementing them together, making it more sticky. And um, that's the word that he might use, and I'll explain that in a bit, and it'll become clear. So that ultimately. So he's mentioned again uh, Mr. Derek Peterson, the consultant that now lives in St. Paul, but does a lot of traveling. Well, of course he does a lot of traveling because he's selling his concepts to communities so he can be their consultant like he was in Hastings, according to the memorandum, and then it's a way to promote it. Now, what does Mr. Derek Peterson take a look at, uh, look like? Let's take a look at uh, one of his brochures that is available on the internet. Let's take a look here. I'll pull it up, uh, the computer there. And this is from the brochure. And, and I think that this brochure, though, gives you a flavor of this program because this program, as I mentioned, is much more comprehensive than anything that D.A.R.E. ever was. And this is a truly uh, social engineering type of program. It, it is. And if you look at the brochure and you read how it, it's discussed, all these different things, uh, how it's, uh, you know, what it's all about, and it's a full spectrum approach. Now, how can a municipality, no matter what your size, how can you engage in a program that is a full spectrum approach when you have the basic everyday essential services that you must deliver to your citizens and that you must be frugal about how you spend their taxpayer dollars? Let's take a look at our next clip. Um, he went to Alaska because Alaska, interestingly, um, at that time had one of the highest rates of, of suicide um, and alcoholism among young people anywhere um, in the United States um, and uh, still faces many struggles. But, but that was really what in part drove this. How do you go into some of these really impoverished, um, in many cases, um, uh, there were native communities that were uh, ravaged by alcoholism and poverty and um, your generational kinds of issues of abuse and um, uh, lack of opportunity and, and, and really bring people up. Ultimately, what he, uh, in, in the course of this integrative youth development, he identified um, and kind of came up with a model. And the model really is a, about what he calls the full spectrum approach to youth development. Now, you heard about the various challenges that faced the Alaskan youth that were part of this first initial project of which he got a grant for, okay? I have looked diligently on the internet to try to find the statistics, the measurable outcomes from that study so that I could look at the raw data myself to see what the measurements are. I could not find it anywhere on the internet. I found a whole lot of other stuff, but I did not find that particular study and the measurements so that I can determine whether or not if what Chief Schnell is saying that Derek Peterson told him is actually accurate. And I hope that the elected officials, that when this comes before them, that they will ask that question, where are the statistics? Now, of course, Ms. Nora Slawick, she is an executive director of a nonprofit. So she is fully versed in nonprofits and how they operate and that if you have a grant and that grant is for a particular project and that project is for a particular uh, purpose and you must complete the project, well, you also need to issue a report 
and you must have measurables. And so she has the background to ask, the inform ask for the information from which to be able to determine is this something that is relevant, first of all, to Maplewood, second of all, is it actually as, as productive as is claimed by the one who created it? And also, I would like them to ask for the documentation of the, uh, the productivity of this program in Hastings because it's in Hastings and yet it seems like nobody knows that it's so close to home. Now, I understand we have another caller on the line. Caller, thank you for calling in. Questions or comments? Wow. Mayor Longry, that's a good point you bring up about the data. Because he, in his statements, the police chief, Paul Schnell, Paul Schnell of Maplewood, says the data shows compellingly that. Now, the question is, what data is he talking about? Is he right. talking about the Hastings data? Or is he talking about Mr. Gary Peterson's data in Alaska? Or is he talking about some other kind of data? Right. Where, where, If uh, there's data that shows so compellingly, this should be very trivial to find. Also, you, wrote, you played a clip there that says, it, it, uh, this is all based on a whole bunch of this highly research-based stuff. I, again, highly researched. Who were the ones that were highly researching it? Was that Gary Peterson or was that Small Schnell? I think we have, uh, we're listening to what you've played at least, the flim flam artist up there at Maplewood and the police chief. Uh, how, can, how can he take the time to do this kind of uh, uh, shystering when he should be working with police officers and training them? Do they just have too much, does he just have too much time on his hands? I Thank don't you. Know. Well, in, in many of the issues that were listed as issues facing the Alaskan youth, like, uh, you know, abuse at home, uh, unemployment, uh, depression, how is a municipality able to help those issues? Well, certainly, if we're talking about unemployment, then that means that the city council needs to focus on what can they do to encourage good paying, sustainable jobs to come to a community, rather than wondering about, oh, woe is me, how are we going to make everyone feel good about themselves, even though they're unemployed, how can we make them feel good about themselves and be unemployed? Let the city council work on the issues that are within their purview, which is if there's a problem with youth unemployment in your community, figure out how you're going to encourage employers to come to your community and provide good paying, sustainable jobs for those youth, because then they will not only be employed, but then they will be happy as well. So let's continue on with our next clip. And he uses Roy G. Briv, um, the old, um, the, full, the color spectrum. And um, when he talks about Roy G. Briv, and I'm just gonna kind of identify what that is, red and, and red is what we would call the rule of five. And I'll make that clear in a bit. Um, and uh, two is orange. So to cut to the chase here, okay, this is an acronym for how this model is set up. So if we go to the computer screen, I'm just going to go straight to the brochure because I think it would have been a whole lot easier to explain it to the commission if you just handed them the brochure, which by the way, I don't believe that they had any of this information in their packet. But you can see where you've got red R is rule of five. So that's the first letter of the acronym. O Orange, these are tangible supports, and it goes through all these things that, that kids can, uh, uh, should have as part of building this uh, trampoline from which they can bounce and spring from and be good, productive uh, adults as they grow up. And so, in essence, again, I don't disagree with this philosophy and this model, but the issue 
ultimately comes down to does a municipality have this as one this mission as one of its primary duties and is this what a police department should be uh, spending their time on so let's continue on let's go to the next clip Next clip. Indigo um, okay, and Biv is the, let's go to um, the, the need next for the care clip. and for the carers. The bottom line is that 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 people who care for young people, okay, good. Uh, I don't care if it's a neighbor, good. how do they get um, how do they get something out of that? How do they get care? And how this is really about community development at the end of the day. It's it's we, we can we couch it in the standpoint of thinking about kids, but this is really about growing a sense of community. And then finally is um, Violet, which is really about how do we build community norms around this? How do we make this so that it's not, it's, it's something that we, this is just what we do. This is what we are. The thing that's cool. So you heard there that part of this, and again, Indigo is one of those, uh, part of that acronym, is the caring for the carers. Okay, so you've got the adults, who are taking care of the kids. So you heard him say, well, what do we give them to make them feel like there's something in it for them? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, how as elected officials are city council members going to instill that feeling within the other adults of their community. Is that something that elected officials can do? Can they have the people, the adults that are helping these kids uh, instill in them that there's something in it for them? I don't know. I, again, I'm not really sure that this is the type of program that a municipality is set up to be able to promote. This is something more that a public or a nonprofit would be engaged in. A nonprofit that is geared towards community building, that works with schools, that works with other youth organizations. Uh, I'm, one organization that comes to my mind is Face to Face, right there on the east side of St. Paul. That's a nonprofit that's working with at-risk youth who, for whatever reason, are homeless. Now, those are the kids that could really benefit from this type of support because they do need to have, you know, five people in their life that want to help them, who are there to promote uh, and give them the kinds of things that, that they're missing from the other parts of their life. But that's a nonprofit that's helping provide those services. They have uh, counselors there, they have the therapists there, they have resources available that they can connect these kids up with. But can a municipality do that? Is that their job when the nonprofit sector is already set up to do this? That's a big question. So let's continue on with our next clip. About this is that when push comes to shove, what the model really begins to do is it becomes highly measurable. Um, we can actually measure um, the strengths of a, of a young person's web. And I'm gonna just demonstrate this and I'm gonna ask um, there are a camera person here, let them know that I'm going to ask you all to come up and take a seat up in the circle here. And um, we'll kind of, we'll, we'll, we won't take long, we'll take a few minutes and we'll just play out what this looks like. So I can have you come up here. So now they all get up, sit around in a circle, and he takes out a big ball of yarn and says, okay, so now we're going to play with our ball of yarn. Again, how is the city going to implement this type of 
program where you have basically groups of people getting together and you facilitate this interaction. Now, that's the type of program that we saw that was being advertised on that brochure that I showed you earlier in the program, where you can actually go to these programs. They're like seminars, they're sessions, where you can learn about how to do all this stuff. And apparently, Ms. Uh, Chief Schnell has done so, and he now is fashioning himself as a facilitator of one of these training programs. Now, Getting back to the idea that it's in Hastings, um, I have up on the screen uh, a report from the Hastings program. It doesn't really give us any numbers or details, but I have it up on the screen so that that way I can at least read it to you so you can see how far they've come in 18 months of their putting the program together. Now it says here, let's take a look here, it says, after within 18 months, the Hastings Youth Development Initiative should be a viable expanding movement. Okay, now this is now another one of those red bells that should be dinging whenever you've got an organization that's connected with your municipal government and your municipal government saying it is now creating a movement We've got a problem because in my mind, a municipal government should be there to provide essential services, police, fire, medical response, if that's something that your city does, taking care of your parks, providing ample free parks for everyone, taking care of the streets, plowing the roads, make sure that you have good sanitary sewer uh, and water treatment, those are the essential services of your city. But is an essential service the creation of a movement? I would ask you. <laughs> Think about it for a moment. Uh, if, if you have an elected official who appears to be uh, too uh, progressive, I'll give you an example. Now, when I was mayor, I felt it was important to protect our neighborhood preserves and our parks and put conservation easements on them so they couldn't be developed for uh, commercial or real estate development. That was deemed to be an improper uh, movement, so to speak, because my gosh, we will be you know, tying the hands of future councils that we cannot have that kind of stuff going on. Well, if you can't protect the public lands, what then gives you the right to be having these movements to uh, meddle into how everybody's interacting with each other? That's not necessarily what the government is here to do. So now let's take a look at, at the, our screen again and see what else it says in this little memorandum. It says that uh, uh, collected data will begin to lay the foundation for the Hastings Student Support Card. We will have the tools for youth to self-assess their level of support. Teams will foster small group dialogue concerning the shared responsibility for educating, supporting, and guiding children and youth. Okay, so now getting to what that other caller's question was. Who did the measurement? This perhaps gives us some insight into who did the measurement. It says we have, we'll have the tools for youth to self-assess. So who's doing the measurement? The youth. And then it says that there will be teams. Well, my question is who in the city of Maplewood is going to moderate these teams, unify these teams, direct these teams, organize them? I have no idea. And then it says, as our success grows, we will gain the support 
as our success grows, we will gain the support of school leaders and at least 15 community-based agencies. So in other words, this has to be successful, a successful initiative of the government before they will have the support of school leaders and the 15 community-based agencies. Isn't that backwards? These are all questions that elected officials should be asking when this type of initiative comes to their town or in front of them at a council meeting. Let's move on to our, uh, jump to our next clip. That the, 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 these adults in, the, in this kid's life should expect more of them than they expect of themselves. And, and I, what I've often thought about myself is I have a lot of people in my life that I think extremely highly of, that I'm connected with. But when, when I apply that standard of people who ultimately expect more of me than I expect of myself, that number of people becomes significantly smaller, right? And I, and I think that's the reality. So this is a, it's just an important designation, an important thing for us to remember. This is a very integral part of this program, this rule of five, is that the children are to identify five people in their life that expect more of them than they expect of themselves. Now think about it for a moment. First of all, the children have to think who in their life really do, has that kind of expectation, okay? And as you heard Chief Schnell say there, is that there are a lot of people like, say for instance, in his life that he knows that he respects, but they don't necessarily expect more of him than what he expects of himself. And I think this puts a child in a conundrum because what if there are only so many adults in their life that fill this category? Will that child feel uh, bad because they have no others in their life? Are they going to be feeling that they're under pressure to try to go and find some adults who will have a greater expectation for them than they have for themselves? Will that make them feel more depressed because they haven't met this rule of five? You see, I could see that if you don't handle this in the correct way with kids who maybe don't have that rule of five, you could have unintended consequences. And again, we're not trained to know how to handle that as citizens, as regular people. I certainly don't think our municipal elected officials have any training to be able to handle this. And everybody can be a uh, armchair or couch uh, psychiatrist. But when you're dealing with young children who are at vulnerable times of their life, is that what you really want? I would rather see organizations such as Face to Face on the East Side who have the skilled uh, staff to work with these, uh, to work with the kids in developing this program than unskilled people who don't know really what unintended consequences might come from if they approach it in the incorrect way. Now, I understand we have a caller on the line. Caller, thank you for uh, calling in. Questions or comments? Anyway, his chief complaint, the police chief, Paul Schnell's chief complaint, it did not bring all kids up. So apparently, he, this is going to be the program that he has in mind that's going to bring all kids up. Now, the thing that seems to be missing in his whole program of the clips you played are the parents. Mm -hmm. I think everybody recognizes, all people recognize that the most significant 
force in almost all kids' lives are their family and, most importantly, their parents. And yet he doesn't seem to be relying or addressing the parents at all. He Ultimately, he seems to be moving away from the parents. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, is this program going to be aimed at the kids who have good parents who are helping them out, or will he be ignoring that group, or is he just going to target people who are in a single household families or families without a father or families based uh, out of with, who have low income and maybe only have a mother in the family? Is he really targeting one group of kids that belong to one type of uh, family situation? Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that's an excellent question because in all of this, in listening to the whole all, uh, hour of this at the commission meeting, there was no mention of how are we going to identify, how are we going to identify the students? It's kind of like it's all students, all adults, all everybody, because as they said in the meeting, and, and Chief Schnell said this several times, it's going to be a campaign. It's going to be a campaign. So if we could, I would like us to jump to clip number, uh, let's see, number uh, 20, I believe it is, where they talk about the campaign. I hope I got it right. Um, so, excuse me. So the program launches in the fall. Do you want to say like September or October? or uh, September or October. Uh -huh. okay. Here... Right now, what we have been doing, we've been, we've, we've, um, Mayor of the City Manager, and I um, have been, had, had, have several meetings with the school district. Okay, now you hear who's initiating this. The Mayor, the City Manager, Melinda Coleman, and Chief Schnell. Okay, so that's who's pushing this initiative. Let's continue on. Uh, we are pursuing some grant funding, and really the, the grant funding is, is really not, a, like I said earlier, it's really about, uh, if, if we think about the way this happens, it really happens by way of community education and by way of, a, it's essentially what Derek Peterson would say, this is really about conducting and developing a successful campaign. Because that's what you're doing is we're teaching and saying everyone has a stake in this. You know, in some communities, they have, they publish books that talk about the assets and the things. How, how do adults talk to young people about this in the back of every squad car, in the back of every church pew, in the, in the, in the little rack outside of the fast food restaurant or whatever it may be? There is a rack of these books and it allows kids and parents to, one, do evaluation of their five or more. Uh, their strings um, and be, begin to measure that. Um, and that becomes uh, one way. Some businesses have done things like put signs up. Um, who are your five? Um, they make pins, that little pins that say, you know, that they may say have a five on it. And, and if you know that, that means that that, per, that adult knows about um, the rule of five. And that's a place where the, the kids can go. And what we would want those adults to do is, if they see a young person someplace, do you know about the rule of five? To be able to have those kinds of conversation and make that normal, um, that's the campaign that we're talking about. I, I do have a quick question. So when we talk about um, one of the five, Someone could be one of the five and not have all the strings, right? So as a parent of a child, you might be one of the five and you might have ten strings because you're providing tangible and intangible. But one of the five could be an employer that might. So we're coming down to the end of the show, but this leaves us with the final question. The kids that need the greatest emotional and financial and uh, su uh, you know support of the community in growing up are they going to be motivated 
by the tools you just heard were going to be used within the community to uh, show and to promote this campaign? Are the at-risk kids going to be motivated by wearing a button on their lapel? Are the at-risk kids going to be motivated to participate in this when the brochures are in all the places that they are not? It makes for a lot of questions. In addition to question of whether or not this is a program that the police department should be implementing, promoting, and campaigning for when they have the duties of public safety number one for their community. So I'm sure that we will see more of this as time goes on. And uh, next week, the studio will, uh, I understand, will be closed, so there won't be a new broadcast next week. But Mr. Kinley will be returning uh, in two weeks and he will have an excellent show as usual to be able to present to you and I hope that you enjoyed this evening's presentation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Sets on fire